Yes, sir. I'll be live in like 10 seconds. My little bar is over here. All right. Yep. So almost there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. And welcome to uh, another panel um, at Introduced Biotechnically. Uh, for this fireside chat, we're going to be discussing the state of the employee experience with uh, two special guest speakers. Uh, first, we have Lloyd Adams, who is the Senior Vice President and Managing Director of the East Region of SAP of North America. And also we have on hand Stephen Ma uh, Maloz is it Malazi? That's it. You got it. Nailed it. Yeah, give me, give me a golden <laughs> start. Uh, we have Stephen Malazi, who is the Senior VP of labor relations and HR transformation at Aramark. So just looking forward to this morning to hearing some great insights from both of these gentlemen about the state of the employee experience. So yeah, without further ado, go ahead. All right, so so Michael, I'll, I'll maybe take the baton from you. So first up, um, just you know, on behalf of Steve and myself, we really want to thank you know everybody from technically for you know allowing us to be here with everybody. Um, albeit virtually, and uh, be part of this, uh, you know, days of events, and and for this particular conversation around uh, what I know Steve and I feel is is a really important topic, and uh, and Steve, it's a real pleasure to be here with you. Uh, obviously, SAP has really enjoyed the partnership that we've been able to develop with Aramark, you know, over the years, and working with you and your team, uh, you know, is is always a treat. And then it's nice to actually be in a conversation too, where we're not talking about you know business with each other per se, but just you know observations that we see, you know, out in the market. And um, you know, Steve, obviously, you know, here in the Philadelphia area, Aramark is is such an iconic you know you know brand. And uh, you know, I think you know people that that live locally around here, you know, know. You know, Aramark by way of, you know, everything that you do at, you know, our stadiums, uh, across our big school campuses, our, our large office locations and, and, and a number of things in between. But I don't think um, everyone might not realize the degree to which just how vast uh, and how global, you know, Aramark is. And when you think about, you know, the markets that you serve uh, internationally and, you know, the fact that like so many companies were now, you know, a year and a half, um, you know, into dealing with the pandemic, at least here locally, starting to come, you know, a bit out of it. But, you know, maybe just to, to start us off, could you just talk a little bit about, you know, your observations and what Aramark's been going through and, and what's it been like in terms of managing a large, diverse, you know, international, you know, workforce uh, these days? And as we slowly start to come out of, you know, COVID and, and everything that it's entailed, you know, what is Aramark really starting to think about when, you know, you think about the future of work? Sure. Great question. And, and thank you, Lloyd, uh, for having me on. And, uh, you know, those feelings are mutual. Really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, you know, I think it's interesting if you rewind the clock, you know, 14 or 15 months uh, ago, I'm not sure any company was prepared for what was about to happen. If they were, kudos to them. I think most large employers, you know, uh, have dealt with, you know, contingency planning and being prepared for things. I certainly know in our operations, you know, we've had to from time to time deal with things like natural disasters, um, but those impact you in one particular location, maybe multiple locations in a particular geography, um, but nothing global like the pandemic. Um, and, you know, for us, if I think about the impact to the to the workforce, it really breaks down into two categories for us. So there were those associates um, and managers for us who had to continue to operate in person, you know, running food service, running facilities, delivering uniforms for customers um, where, where they couldn't shift to remote work. And so for them and that employee population, everything was about safety. So in those early days, it was making adjustments to, you know, our operations uh, and figuring out how to keep employees and customers safe and secure uh, so that they could continue to perform their jobs. And so, you know, that involved things like social distancing, um, different cleaning protocols, providing the right personal protective equipment, 
uh, you know, just a dramatic shift, though, for those employees who are used to working for years and years in a particular way. And then you throw a lot of disruption at them, you know, to operate in a safe environment when there is a global pandemic underway. Um, you know, I think the other category, though, is those that were fortunate enough to be able to shift their work from an office location to remote. Um, and for those employees, you know, in the beginning, the focus for us was certainly around technology and tools. So how did you duplicate that office environment experience so that the individuals who were used to coming into a headquarters location, a regional office, et cetera, uh, were able to operate just as effectively from home? And that's, you know, things as simple as printers and monitors, making sure, you know, the Wi-Fi was working the right way and security was handled. And I would say, you know, got to some quick issues around things like Teams and how do you create better collaboration um, when you're in an all virtual environment. And so that was kind of wave one. And I would say that that lasted a few weeks. And then I felt like, you know, things had sort of settled down. We began to adjust to that, still thinking it was going to be short term. I think most most of us in the beginning thought it was maybe going to be a couple of months at the at the longest. Yeah. Um, you know, as it as it dragged on and became more serious, um, that were those working from home individuals, there was a shift from getting them the right technology to, OK, this is going to be a long term thing and it's going to last for months, you know, and certainly now over a year. The shift became how do you keep remote employees connected? Um, what do we do to keep them engaged, maintain enthusiasm? Uh, I think, for you know, from I'll speak for my own teams you know, maintaining the right ways to collaborate and figuring out how to do things a little more creatively for yes. some of the project teams in particular that I have the, the pleasure of leading. They're used to getting into a room with whiteboards and, you know, spending hours collaborating with one another. That's a lot harder to do when you've got folks dispersed and everyone's trying to do it remotely. You know, whiteboards don't work as well. Um, you know, you had to adjust to how to use a chat feature. Um, and then I would say maybe just as important, the home work-life balance, um, I, I think, really became complicated when you're, you know, you're, you no longer have a commute to and from work. Yeah. You basically wake up, you know, you're ready to roll out of bed and your emails are up, you know, your computer's ready to go. And so found a lot of employees, I think, burning the candle at both ends and even in the middle, extending their work hours almost justifying if I'm not on a train, if I'm not commuting, if I'm not on the bus, you know, that I'll get on a call an hour early. I'll stay an hour later because, you know, dinner is right next door instead of having to travel home. Um, and that that worked OK in the beginning. But we had to you know monitor that and make sure employees were preserving themselves. We didn't want to see anybody get burned out. The pandemic caused a lot of stress outside of work. Uh, and so those were key considerations for us. You know, when you talk, Lloyd, about the future of work, I think what's going to be facing all of us right now as we hopefully are getting towards the other side of the pandemic is those things aren't going to go away. Yeah. It's how you take the learnings from this past year plus and incorporate them into work environments of the future. Uh, because some of these things like working from home, I think, are here to stay in some capacity as we move post the pandemic. Look, all great points. And actually, one of you kind of hit on indirectly one of the questions that we've seen come in through the chat, um, because, you know, Aramark, I think, like a lot of organizations and SAP, even though our business is different from yours, has some similarities in so much as, you know, you have a portion of your employee base that is, you know, out in the field, you know, dealing with customers and partners and, and so forth. And then you've got others who are, you know, corporate or more, you know, used to a day-to-day -day office environment and, and you've got to kind of juggle, you know, what those different constituencies need, you know, both through the lens of, you know, safety for them, but then also in particularly for your field workers, you know, safety for the clients that you're serving and, and you know, on site and, and so forth. And then, you know, add the added layer that Aramark sees internationally and every time you start to feel like things are sort of getting a bit under control, maybe in one part of the world, you know, as we're all seeing unfold, there's there's certain markets where um, the spikes and, and, you know, the surges are happening, you know, um, on different time frames and at different levels and waves. And so it's, it's just it's a lot. It's a lot to juggle, um, you know, in terms of 
you know, just a reaction, I think, to some of the, the, the things that, you know, you commented on. I mean, a lot of, of synergies, I would say, um, you, you know, I think the last year and a half has, has really, when I think about it, I think of like three really big themes. Um, you know, one is that, you know, you hit on it. We really need to be doing a better job of, of listening um, and, and really understanding, you know, and employee feedback. Uh, and, and even more so than before, um, heightening the frequency of pulse checks that we do. Um, particularly, Steve, as you said, around, you know, health and, and well-being and, you know, are we meeting, you know, the needs that, that people have in ways that, that they didn't before? Because I think you're so right. We've observed it, too, and I'm sure many in the audience have, particularly in the beginning of COVID when it was unclear how things were going to go. And in the absence of other activities, you know, people really, uh, in many cases, kind of, uh, you know, that who were already working quite hard, you know, really kept pouring it on um, as a means of coping with the uncertainty that that COVID provided. And I think, you know, burnout certainly, I think, for for so many of us became a, a real factor. I think another theme, you know, beyond listening, um, you know, another word that I describe a lot, and I know we've talked about it, is just, you know, versatility, right? Um, you know, in the beginning, I think so many organizations worried about, um, you know, can can we pivot, you know, to, to working, you know, uh, very virtually, um, very remote. And, and in some cases, in some industries, you know, obviously, um, it, you know, it's, it's been super tough. Um, and others, you know, organizations have been able to to kind of power through it, um, you know, better than others. Um, but wherever you stand on that continuum, um, you know, there's other things from the employee experience that you still need to carry on. And, you know, one of them, for instance, is just, you know, ongoing um, skill development and, and career nurturing. You know, so one of the things that uh, I know is really, you know, keen for Airmark and SAP shares it as an imperative. Uh, we, we've really tried you know, to, to do our best to figure out, you know, through, through some of the online learning tools and so forth that we have, you know, can we, you know, continue to make, you know, some of that type of, um, you know, focus, you know, present for our employees and kind of the top of their piles, so to speak, because, you know, just because we're operating in a pandemic and we're, and we're operating virtually, um, it doesn't mean, hopefully shouldn't have to mean, that you know employees can't still find the requisite time to you know to focus on you know their advancement and the development and 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 building skills albeit a bit differently and then you know the third theme you know that i i, I think was very much um you know reflective in, in your earlier comments is just flexibility right and and i think one thing that the last year and a half has has really proven and i think it's also going to help us as we look forward from here is you know whether you're a field worker or whether you're an office worker or you know some other type um as we you know manage the business or or work within the business there there really isn't a, a one size fits all approach anymore and you know we, we used to always talk about work-life balance and i think it's taken on a whole different meaning um, but I think one of the things that COVID has shown is that um, certainly everybody is not the same and, and people, you know, work different hours. They have different styles of working, styles of communication um, and, and even technologies like the one we're using right now, um, while it's, I think, excellent for things like this. Um, you know, you, you need to look very far anymore to read about articles where people have, you know, fatigue with Zooms and uh, teams and so forth. And so technology's really helped, but I still think we need to be um, judicious about, you know, how and when we apply it, uh, particularly as we start to come more and more uh, out of this. So, you know, at the end of the day, I think, you know, kind of um, empathy and, and, and really being comfortable with things being fluid um, has been really important. And I think moving forward, um, COVID's kind of necessitated and, and demanded that, you know, companies remain adept at that moving forward, I, I think.
Yeah, uh, you know, Lloyd, it, it, some excellent points there. Yeah. I mean, one that I think has been, you know, significantly challenging for managers that are dealing with individuals remotely is is back to that sort of the, the mental health, their state, you know, how's their engagement? Because if you think about in an office environment, you're seeing your team day in and day out. If someone's having a bad day or they just seem off, you're kind of seeing that and you're able to jump in. You know, you're having hallway conversations, you know, that, that I think helps from a development standpoint, from a coaching standpoint. When everybody is remote, um, you're just not seeing that. And while I think a lot of our managers, you know, did a did a phenomenal job of adjusting and setting up specific one-on-ones um, and trying to maintain some level of engagement, it just isn't the same when you're on Teams and Zoom calls all day long and you're not seeing your team in person for such a prolonged period of time. Um, and so, you know, I think that that, for us, we try to put a lot of things in place um, you know, we've got some some health and wellness focused events that we rolled out um, for employees to participate in. Um, I think our ERG, so our employee resource group participation, you know, we really pushed on that so that employees had a network beyond just their typical manager and, and you know, co-employees. Uh, because for those working remotely, you know, I think within a couple of months, you started to feel isolation setting in. Even though you're working longer hours, you know, you're on calls all the time, you still, I think for a lot of folks, there was a feeling of isolation because you're not getting to grab a cup of coffee with somebody. You're not getting to sit down and have lunch with them. And so the social aspects of work that I think are so important for that holistic employee experience just disappeared. It was challenging to put them back in place. Well, and and, and I think some of the unique things that organizations did in the beginning, you know, regardless of size of company or industry that they were in or that they served. Um, I, I think there was a lot of syndicating of good ideas that people did, you know, uh, things like virtual happy hours or workout sessions or, or you know, I've heard of companies doing like um, virtual, you know, open mic nights for like people that are aspiring musicians or comedians or whatever. But but. I also think it's true that, you know, as some time elapsed, uh, you know, even some of those very well intended and well received in the beginning ideas started to, to kind of, there was some fatigue with that too. And, and I think now we're noticing as we're, we've now been at this so long, a lot of organizations, um, you know, again, depending on the forum and the audience, if it happens to be a group of people that know each other really well, you know, maybe just doing it as a traditional conference call, like that's okay, right? Or if it's a one-on-one, -on -one, but it's somebody that you know really well, um, you can do voice to voice only because maybe that allows the person on either side to kind of untether to the machine and walk around or go walk their dog or what, you know, whatever the case may be, because, uh, because any way you look at it and you look at the total day, people are still putting in more than they were before time-wise because they're not commuting and they're not traveling and they're not out in the field as much and so forth. And so it, I think it'll be really, certainly without a doubt, there will be flashing forward a, a bottom line um, impact and improvement, hopefully in quality of life. And also in terms of like how much, you know, companies spend on travel and face-to-face. -face. Um, but I don't believe we're going to go from, none to what, what it was before, but it'll be interesting to see where each company brings the pendulum back somewhere in the center. Um, and, and also the flexibility that organizations like Aramark and SAP and those in the audience today are going to have to have in terms of, um, you know, how we retain and, and attract talent moving forward. It's, it's, uh, it's going to be fun. But Steve, let me, let me, let me I want to shift gears a little bit because like, you know, having gotten to know you, like I have over the years and, you know, Michael, as he introduced us, you know, he, he cited you one way, but I know for a fact you wear about, depending on the day, anywhere from four, sometimes upward of, of 10 hats at Aramark. But one of the biggest, you know, things, one of many that you're challenged with right now is, is rolling out, you know, some, some new technological capabilities across, you know, the whole expanse of your, your global employee base. And, you know, I wanted to ask, um, stepping outside of work for a second and just how pervasive, you know, intuitive tech ha has become at the home, right? Whether you're talking things like Alexa or Nest or Amazon, you know, what have you. I mean, it's, 
it's it's crazy how you know much they've you know tech like that has become part of the fabric of our life in the in the household and how simple to use they are and so forth and and as you look at some of the things that you and your team are tasked with doing now in the context of Airmark, you know, for your employees and, and ultimately even for your customers, how is some of that um, move in tech, you know, kind of on the home front personally um, influenced, you know, where you see tech going um, through the lens of, you know, employee experience and, and tech at work? Yeah, very interesting question, Lloyd. I would say, you know, if I go back to, I guess it was just about two years ago, we made the decision um, to do a global install of SAP success factors for our full hire to retire suite. Um, and I would say the, the main driver behind that was to improve our candidate employee and manager experience. So, you know, we wanted at the time, I think we, there was recognition that those technologies you were mentioning have made things so much easier at home. And yet for a lot of our technologies at work, you know, we're on hosted solutions or things that were put in place years ago and technology evolved so quickly um, that it there's often, I think, a stark contrast between, you know, I can go on to Amazon, I can use Alexa at home to get things done very easily. But when I'm at work, the same type of a task, you know, purchasing goods, filling out forms, maintaining information seems much harder and more difficult. And so, you know, we were starting that journey um, before the pandemic hit. What I would say is that with the pandemic, certainly for the employees that are working from home, I think what we saw is that contrast between technology at work and technology at home came yeah. cracking together because now you're, you're performing your job in the same space where you have access to all this other technology. Um, and so, you know, we got a lot of feedback around you know, how do we make things faster, better, easier? Um, and I think you summed it up well with the word intuitive. That's really the name of the game, because if I think about how individuals use their technologies at home, you know, when you go onto Amazon, there's not a 30 minute training course you need to go through, right? That you get on and you kind of feel your way around. And within a matter of minutes, you can figure out how to purchase, how to search for goods, it doesn't take a whole lot of training. And so I think that, you know, what we're striving for within Aramark with our global um, HR project is to duplicate a lot of that within the candidate experience, within the hiring experience, you know, whether you're an employee, whether you're a manager, it's allowing you the access and then making it as intuitive as possible. So you don't need a lot of help for us. If, if we can unlock employee self-service and manager self-service, um, that will be a key success for that project because we want to empower and enable our employees. It, by the way, all the way from the frontline associates that are working every day in our operations, serving food, you know, handling facilities work, all the way up to our most senior executives, we want a very similar experience for them. Uh, you know, and so far we've only deployed in one region. So we went live about a little over a month ago um, in Northern Europe. So for us, that's UK and Ireland operations. Um, and I would say early indicators are that we are, you know, definitely delivering on that commitment we made um, with our employees that they're going to have a better experience. And, you know, I think as we look forward, Lloyd, one of those adjustments, I think individuals are going to want to see technology at work advance at a faster pace than it histor historically has. Well, I, and, and honestly speaking, and I know SAP obviously has a vested interest in this being a tech company and being one of your partners, but it's our hope that that happens. And I think it's going to be interesting to see, you know, as you mentioned, you know, um, kind of early part of the journey, if you will, and, and what um, early, you know, success that user groups going to have and some of the next stage, you know, requests or, or demands that they might have in parallel with seeing things unfold, you know, market by market as the, the rest of this first wave of the journey starts and um, the totality of that, you know, I think um, it, it, it's going to be, you know, interesting to, to see how it unfolds and then likely inform um, you know, other types of, of, you know, kind of tech transformations that happen, you know, outside of say the HR function in other parts of the business. So it's, uh, it's exciting to see. 
So. Yeah, I'm, cu I'm curious, Lloyd, I mean, given the nature of the business that SAP is in, um, what have you all seen in terms of this shift from hosted technologies to more software as a solution, you know, license-based products? Because that, at least for us, that's been a key thing that we are looking at, to your point, not just within HR, but across all of our functions and all of our operations. Well, it's a great question, right? And I think, um, you know, the way that we're doing things together right now and doing it in a way where uh, everything is, is you know, cloud-based um, and, and as you said, software as a service, uh, you know, another way to think of that is, um, you know, a phrase that we use a lot is, is fit to standard, right? And, and, and that's important because um, that's a departure, I think, from how um, organizations, you know, in the tech space like SAP and, and others um, used to approach things whereby, you know, we would come into an organization and we would, um, you, you know, almost kind of highly customize, um, you know, how something ought to work based on the way things kind of had been going versus being a little bit within said company uh, versus, you know, saying, hey, look, you know, this, you know, um, solution has been you know kind of built for purpose um, and informed by a lot of good practices across you know markets and industries and so forth and while it may be a change in the early going in terms of how you utilize it um, in the end you know it's it, it should provide um, easier and, and broader access um, it should allow you know the assets to get used for longer periods of time and when there are changes to it it's changes coming from you know the, the partner versus changes that you need to build and maintain and you know uh experience the costs with that um and it's always evolving in a way that um it is kind of informed by where the market seems to be heading right and and i think that's important because it then um the less that an organization like aramark or or any company needs to be focused on you know those types of things you know the more time that it it frees up and allows um you know say in the case of aramark to to really focus on you know the things that are vital you know to to your business and and what services and offerings that you provide to the market that you know allow you to differentiate and and i also think you know again since we're here talking about employee experience um it, it will the, the less companies need to focus on kind of the nuts and bolts of making the tech work, uh, the more they can, you know, focus on the things that, you know, are, are likely, you know, more exciting. And so um, free up a lot more uh, strategic time for employees, which is obviously a huge benefit too. So, so a lot to unpack there, but I think as the world is moving more and more to, to software as a service and, and cloud, um, you know, it, it, not, and not to mention, I guess, you know, very importantly, um, it allows tech companies like us to not only um, do all the things that I said, but to also really keep an intense focus on usability, right? And, and the intuitive nature of the tech and how it's deployed in organizations, because, you know, in the same way that, you know, those in your household and mine, you know, have certain expectations around how they use things like, you know, Amazon and Alexa and so forth. Um, we, we know that people want that from their tech at work now. They demand it. It's not just a nice to have. It's like it's a got to have it. And so, you know, the, operating more and more as a as a service type of, of you know, um, environment allows companies like SAP to, to be laser focused and fixated on that. So I think it's all really important and it ties back to the employee experience. Yeah, you know, you mentioned Lloyd that the access piece. We haven't really talked about that, but that that's another key area, you know, and, and I think a significant learning for us was around how employees access the technology. Um, and so, you know, especially in our operations, if you think about what we do, so you know, we're serving food, we're caring for facilities in hospitals and stadiums and arenas on higher ed campuses, um, in K through 12, in business settings. And, and what that means is our employees and, and in particular, our managers are constantly on the go. And so having them be tethered to a laptop to execute transactions or, or handle things just isn't, it's not a great model. When again, at, at home, they're used to, they can download an app for just about anything 
and yes. carry it around in their pocket and be able to, you know, take care of things, whether it's paying bills, you know, or accessing their insurance policies, or I mean, just think about everything that somebody needs to do. There's pretty much an app for that these days. Um, to, for us, getting that shift away from technologies that require laptop access and making things easy to use from a smartphone, from a tablet, um, we think is just going to unlock a tremendous amount of value for those employees, particularly the ones that are constantly on the go. And I, you know, that makes up the bulk of our operations or people that are trying to take care of customers or interacting with clients. They're not sitting behind a desk. Um, and I think for a long time, that sort of the corporate side of things drove the technology. Um, and I think we're seeing a significant shift now to the operations driving the technology and having it be better, more user friendly for the folks that are, um, you know, in the field for us. Well, exactly. And it's interesting because, and, and I have to confess, Steve, until I got to know, you know, you guys and worked really closely with Aramark, it, it didn't automatically always, I, I always knew, you know, who Aramark was and, and where you were, maybe not as, I, I knew at least portions of it. I didn't know how broadly of the market you served and, and the different segments and so forth. But, but certainly there were certain things that I, I knew you for, but, but now that I've gotten to know you, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing the degree to which, you know, Aramark really leads the way and in, in what you could call frictionless, you know, technology and, and, you know, pioneers and things like, you know, touchless uh, systems for uh, guest convenience and so forth. And so if you, if you tie that back to, you know, COVID and the pandemic, um, has, has that, on the one hand, one might think, you know, gosh, because people haven't been going to games or schools as much, um, it's maybe set things back. But I, I'm wondering, has has it also maybe in some respects, um, you know, provided an opportunity for, you know, acceleration on the tech front and that'll inform kind of where you go from here? Any any perspective on that? Uh, yeah, no doubt, Lloyd, that that. Um... There was also a push, I think, on that contactless, frictionless transactions uh, across our operations. And you know, while while some were certainly more significantly impacted, so you know, you talk about stadiums and arenas, we saw either no or very limited attendance. Um, feels like this summer we're getting back to significant attendance in those spaces. You know, we had other operations like hospitals um, where things you know either stayed the same for them from an operating standpoint or they got even busier than normal as they were trying to deal with the consequences of the pandemic um, and so for sure trying to to um you know increase the ease of those transactions both from a user experience from a speed of transaction and then you know keeping in mind safety um, making them as contactless as possible uh, really became sort of a forefront for us in adjusting our operations in this, you know, COVID-19 world that we were forced to deal with. And so um, we, you know, we definitely rolled out a lot of technology in our front line that was, that was both employee and customer facing. Um, so moving from, from cash to cashless wherever we could, uh, you know, on the food side, installing more grab and go options. So making it easier for folks to grab what the items that they needed, um, and then you know addressing the specific needs of clients. So if, if I look at our healthcare space, you know we were really proud of our efforts um, to in, in that space where you think about those employees, the nurses, the doctors, the technicians in hospitals were working crazy shifts um, to try to care for the folks impacted by COVID. Um, we stood up pop-up grocery stores, nothing we'd ever done before, but yeah. recognizing that we were providing a critical service, you know, to meet their needs. They were eating with us in our dining operations. Um, it wasn't that a step too far to say, hey, they're also in need of personal goods for home, be it produce, be it, you know, cleaning supplies, et cetera. Um, and nobody wanted to be, if you're on a 12-hour shift in a hospital, the last thing you want us to have to go find a grocery store that's open, potentially have to wait in line to get in um, and go through that experience. And so we took the products that were in highest demand and started selling them out of our operations in hospitals, mostly as a convenience for the doctors and nurses, you know, to help the hospital maintain their engagement, you know, keep them satisfied, 
help them with their own, um, you know, health and safety. And so, you know, a lot of operational adjustments, I think, to to address the circumstances we were facing. No, that, that, that's really, it's fascinating. And I guess um, I, I can only imagine, you know, the, the impact that that had in terms of how fluid operations needed to be and, and, and kind of your, your, your staffs and so forth. But, you know, at the same time, um, like, like every organization, you know, you, you would likely have, um, you know, employees come and still come and go. Right. Um, and, and despite, you know, um, COVID and so forth. And so can you talk a little bit about that, Steve, in terms of, you know, um, whether a large employer like Aramark or even, you know, small and, and mid-sized firms, you know, any thoughts in terms of through the lens of things that we've learned over the last year and a half or so, um, you know, how do you think things are going to maybe look and, and feel different in terms of how we attract and retain talent in, in the years that come, especially as we start to come out of this? Sure. Um, you know, I think I'll go back to what a couple of, of terms that you used. Uh, you know, you talked about flexibility. Uh, you know, you talked about sort of the perseverance. I would add resilience. I think from from an employer side, those I think have always been part of the hiring criteria. But I don't know that they're they, they've had the prominence in that process that they will have moving forward. Because what we've all experienced through this is, you know, watching the most adaptable of our employees and managers and leaders. Um, and now I think there is a greater value on those, you know, those aspects and skills and abilities of employees. And so I see them in the recruiting process taking on an even um, greater level of importance. Um, because while none of us hopefully will expect another global pandemic anytime soon, you know, I think the learning is that if, if folks could navigate those circumstances, you can trust that they can navigate any other circumstances effectively, you know, and be a, a great employee for us. I think on the flip side, on the employee side, what we're experiencing is, you know, employees being more selective. So candidates being more selective about their choice of employer um, and the things that matter to them have definitely, um, you know, changed. Um, and I'm getting a couple of messages. I know my camera turned off. I've tried to reset it. And I, uh, for some reason, it says it's on, but it seems not to be working. Well, do we hear, we hear you loud and clearly, so don't worry. <laughs> You're coming through great. Um, you know, so, so that those candidates, what we're finding, Lloyd, is, you know, they want more information about things like diversity, equity, inclu and inclusion. They want to know about our... Um, you know, programs and plans, you know, with respect to the planet, with respect to people. Um, and that was, again, was always part of the process, but it seems to have taken on a much greater emphasis, you know, as we're in this pandemic and coming through the other side of it. Um, and so, you know, we see that as a critical area of focus. And I think for our organization, we've always had such a strong commitment to things like DE&I. Uh, but I don't know that we've always translated it in a way that employees coming in the door uh, get to know us at that candidate stage and understand all of the great things that we do, you know, whether it be around diversity and inclusion um, or whether it be around our commitments, you know, with respect to greenhouse gases or sustainability. Uh, and so that's taken on a much more prominent role for us. Um, and I think it's going to become part of that talent journey for companies. Um, you've got to sell your company to a candidate, maybe more so than you ever have, you know, have in the past. Um, and I don't think that goes away. I think that, you know, combination of all the things going on in the world, not just the pandemic, you know, but you talk about social justice and what has been going on in the world. You talk about a political environment that is, you know, essentially unprecedented. Um, I think that that's influencing people in where they want to work and how they want to work. And so that, you know, the global pandemic should ease and we, we feel like we're getting close to the other side of it. But I think the world has changed in such a significant way. It will continue to impact that talent um, acquisition side and bringing the right people into organizations and convincing them that you're the right organization for them to join. 
Look, I know I, I would 100% agree. And I also think it sounds like you would agree, Steve, that, you know, through the lens of employers, you know, it, it really should open the aperture in terms of maybe not as much for field roles, but but for, um, you know, more of the kind of the office or, or kind of the corporate type of roles, um, you know, whereas in the past organizations may have, you know, limited, you know, their their searches for, you know, qualified, qualified, you know, candidates within a, a said, you know, stated mile radius. Um, I, I think what we've just been through and remain in right now has demonstrated that um, you can look, you know, a lot further and wider than perhaps um, we did before. Um, and as we do that, it should allow us to also um, be a lot more intentional um, and, and, and more inclusive in terms of some of the other diverse talent, talent pools um, that, that we try and, you know, um, curate from, whereas maybe we, we weren't as able to do that as, as intentionally as before, um, at which, which I think is a, you know, is a bonus, you know, for, for hiring organizations. And it's going to, I think, really galvanize uh, like talent acquisition and, and recruiting teams. It needs to, right? Because if they don't get a bit more open-minded and savvier about that and continue to do things as they've always done them, um, you know, I think some of those types of orgs will be a bit left behind. And then if you think about it, you know, through, you know, alternatively through the lens of, um, you know, the, the applicant or, or the eventual employee, um, you know, again, maybe more so for certain types of roles than others, but, um, you know, people should, I think, feel more emboldened to look, um, you know, pretty wide, right? And and not necessarily, you know, um, rule certain organizations, you know, out of their, their wish list, so to speak, because maybe they feel like they live too far away, whatever the case may be. And, um, and I think that's exciting. And I think that that's, um, you know, going to have an impact on how, um, you know, people raise their hand for opportunities, how they, need to think about, you know, positioning you know, themselves so that they can start to maybe stand out to organizations that wouldn't have, you know, reached into their geo to, to look for them um, and so forth. But as as all of that starts to to marinate and, and happen, um, I, I think uh, it, it'll put everybody in a better position, right? Employees should have more opportunity and organizations should have, you know, broader and, and wider pools from from which to uh, to pull from. So it's exciting. Yeah, I mean that's a great point, Lloyd. That 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 will create so much value and benefit for both the candidates and employees, but also the organizations. You know that that access to individuals that maybe in the past were not within the hiring zone because of things like geography, et cetera. You know, as you expand the talent pools, I think it really unlocks some of the challenges that organizations have with DEI, right? And and creating that diverse workforce um you know hopefully some of this will ease that and make it make it just a better experience all the way around i know i know at aramark we're we're very excited about where we think this employee experience is going um, and how talent acquisition will work moving forward um you know and, and we're going to need a lot of people as our operations are continuing to open up um you know we see stadiums i think you know if you read the news you could see Stadiums are going to be probably at full capacity, you know, starting in the short term. Uh, you know, our national parks operations just, you know, the world feels like at least at least in the U.S., there are some countries that are still having significant challenges. I think we're fortunate in the U.S. that it feels like we're on the cusp of getting back to something that is a lot closer to what we all understood as normal um, versus what we've been dealing with the past 14, 15 months. Well, look, I think maybe that's a that's a good uh, seg and a, and a nice way to wrap up, Steve. It just, I, you know, maybe on behalf of, you know, all of the uh, the Philly, you know, area enthusiasts that are, you know, with us today in conversation, and I'll count myself as one of them. I, I you know, we we all can't wait to get, you know, back to the stadiums in the area and and have our students, you know, spending more time, you know, on their campuses and so forth. And just on behalf of everybody here in the Philly area, thanks so much to you and your team at Aramark for all the things that you do to make sure we have, you know, great experiences at the places that we go. And um, we wish you and your team all the best as you, um, you know, continue the journey that you're on in terms of, of making the employee experience at Aramark 
uh, you know, an increasingly better one. So, uh, and, and, you know, look to the folks that technically, you know, thanks so much for, for having Steve and I today, and we wish you a great rest of the day and a great um, rest of the sessions uh, and the conference. So uh, I think I'm going to stop the broadcast now and uh, Michael and team, uh, good luck with the rest of the program. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.